But it wasn't until 1931 that the Daughters of the Confederacy approached the uh, uh, Hoover and said, we want to be our national anthem. So there was a big fight over it. And they dropped the song. And did the Daughters want to keep it going? Of course. Daughters of the Confederacy. Yeah. So that's, I'm not that's, daughters of the American Revolution. No, no, I'm not no, daughters. Yes, so that's, that's when, when, so that's when it wasn't until I didn't realize they didn't adopt it to our national anthem until 1930. And I didn't realize they were petitioning. But it was just, I was wondering. I knew it was in the 30s, but I had no idea why. I thought they just said one day someone said, let's make it official. So you're saying before then, at sporting events, what they have done in my country is a that a civil war. Yeah, there are a lot of
because they were escaping, you know, the South. Yeah. And then that's that's when things really started to change in D.C. And we actually had Reconstruction era laws in D.C. banning uh, segregated facilities. And that is how segregation did not enter with the Civil Rights Act. It ended in 1952. Somebody challenged an old. Uh, after the Korean War, a lot of vets came back and said, I fought in Korea and I can't shop in that department store. Or buy a house. Or buy a house. Yeah. 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 So, so they challenged it and they said, there's a law in the books here from the Reconstruction era that says segregated facilities are illegal in the district. And they, they won their court case. So segregation here, when my grandmother came to D.C. in 1954 as a nursing school student, it was illegal here to have segregated facilities, but not in Maryland where she went to high school. Well, we did have segregated schools. But was it? Oh, de facto, not de facto. They're not a, yeah. They, they stopped isn't there still de facto segregation though? Oh yeah, there's still, there's probably still de facto segregation. Yeah, but like, it is de facto. You go to one part of town, you're gonna see more of one, you're gonna see yeah. more of one group than oh, the yeah, other. I mean, like the, the high school's on the other side of the Anacostia River. I don't know what, the, I, and I can guess with certainty that they're probably Springbrook High School, but they weren't, they were bused to Blair. Yeah. And then my dad grew up in Fairfax County, Dave. Good grade school. Her brother, when he went to grade school, on the Mississippi River right. with Vicksburg. Yeah, Vicksburg. Vicksburg. Vicksburg and New Orleans was uh, right. recaptured or I guess held on to by the Union rather quickly. But and they and Sherman did a number on Atlanta, but somebody decided with Savannah. It was too historical. They didn't right. want to touch yep. it. Up. So they made a deal yeah. that they would just give it up without without any kind of uh, resistance. But they promised they promised the freed slave, mm -hmm. ex I, I want to say 40 acres and a mule. Oh, okay. And that never went, you know, it's like almost like an Indian tree. <laughs> it didn't oh, it didn't actually uh, carry out. No. Grant, when you show me a statue of Grant, he pulled the federal, he put, pulled the troops out of the south, and that's when I held it. 
at the peak. Yeah, yeah, because that's when there was some real progress in the South. Yeah, it, it was amazing. There were um, black uh, elected officials. This was amazing. And I think this was a forgotten part of American history that people need to go back and read. Because imagine if we had modernized that much earlier. And then after 10 years, it just went back to the world. Okay. Okay. Now, before we leave, I wanted to ask each group where you're. We still have the White House, and then the tour ends there. I wanted to ask each group where you're headed after this, so I can figure out an appropriate drop-off location. So I'll start with you three. Oh, well, I can just drop you off at Air and Space if you want. Okay, okay. and then you, you two? Where, where, where go? Uh, 14th Street and I Street. Okay, 14th and I works for, works for me. And then what about you two? Where, uh, where are you headed after uh, the last stop of the tour? Oh, the old, okay, I can drop you off at the post office. All right, okay. Uh, for the post office, check what time that bell tower closes. Um, you can probably check it on your phone. I just want to make sure. I feel like someone told me they stop at 4, but maybe it's 6. I just can't remember. But the old National Post Office will have their hours on their website there. Okay, so... <laughs> So since I couldn't join you for this part of the tour, bye Tom, since I couldn't join you for this part of the tour, I'm going to do a debriefing with you on the way to the White House, and I always like to say symbolism down to the details. I don't know if you count it, but there were 87 steps into the Lincoln Memorial, 80, 87 corresponding to the Gettysburg Address, four score, seven years ago, Abraham Lincoln's call for national unity. He wrote the whole speech on the train ride from Gettysburg. Uh, from Washington to Gettysburg, which is part of the reason why it's so short. He got straight to the point. It ended up being his most famous speech of all. In Gettysburg, he made the speech there, yeah, a few months after the battle that took place there. That ended up being the turning point of the Civil War. At that point onward, the Confederate Army retreating south, surrendering at Appomattox Courthouse in 1865. On the right-hand side of Lincoln, you have his second inaugural address, and I think the main takeaway of that is at the end when he says, with malice towards none, with charity for all. That's his way of signaling how he's going to deal with the aftermath of the Civil War. He had the authority as commander-in-chief to punish those who served in the Confederate Army, but instead his tone at the first day of his second term is one of reconciliation, forgiveness, and just moving on as a reunited country. So that is Lincoln's agenda for his second term. He mentions midway through that speech that one-eighth of the U.S. population had been enslaved. This is a staggering statistic. It's also the first time that he's talking about slavery in the past tense. Oh. So it is a whole new country at the beginning of Lincoln's second term, but he was sadly assassinated uh, just a few weeks later at Ford's Theater here in Washington, D.C. by John Wilkes Booth. And uh, let's talk about the architecture again. It's neoclassical in, in design. More Greek than Roman there. You might see a resemblance to the Parthenon that sits on top of the Acropolis in Athens. And that theme of national unity, all the states there at the top. You have also marble being used from all over the country to build the Lincoln Memorial. Most of it coming from Colorado. But Henry Bacon and Daniel French, who designed the memorial, they purposely used marble from the state of Georgia for Lincoln's uh, sculpture there, so that uh, it would be a memorial for the whole country, not just the southern, st uh, not just the northern states that won the war. Now back there, the brown building with the tan building with the square windows there, that is the State Department. So ambassadors making their way around the world there. Also here. Albert Einstein, behind him, the National Academy of Sciences. That was founded during the Lincoln administration. It is now a privately, yeah, privately run entity. Kids love this statue in DC because people are encouraged to climb on it. And uh, if you touch his nose, he's supposed to spread some of his genius. And someone joked yesterday and said, well, maybe COVID. So. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if that tradition has aged uh, with the times, but they say uh, sometimes you can kind of see his nose is a little bit gold there from people touching it.
And then the next building you're going to see beyond it, this uh, white fence uh, at, at the next building coming up on my left. That's the Federal Reserve, the central bank, been in the news a lot lately given the 40-year record high inflation. So that'll be the next building coming up on my left. But back to the Lincoln Memorial, coming down the steps there, you can see the reflecting pool in front of you. The reflecting pool in the memorial had their 100th anniversary in May, so that was really exciting. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's only surviving child was actually in attendance. He was quite elderly at the time. On the right side of the reflecting pool, the Korean War Memorial, and this is a different chapter of American history, the Cold War. The Cold War was an ideological battle between the Soviet Union, the United States, and their allies. That war started in 1950. It continued for three years. In 1953, you have the death of Joseph Stalin, the, lead, the Soviet leader. At that point, a ceasefire declared along the 38th parallel, which to this day divides the communist north from the now democratic south. If you walked into the memorial there, you would see 19 statues in the middle, all facing different directions, meant to uh, sort of uh, show the confusion of war, a somber mood there given the tragic loss of life. But it's especially quite somber and moving at night, those soldiers a little bit haunting to look at. You also have a wall of remembrance added in July. Many historians have called the Korean War the Forgotten War, and for that reason, a wall of remembrance added in July. A delegation from South Korea was in, in attendance, as well as many Korean War veterans. And that wall of remembrance has the names of the 43,000 soldiers who died fighting for uh, the United States in, in Korea over those three years. The Korean War was the first war with the desegre desegregated military and also desegregated U.S. military and also the first with the widespread usage of helicopters. So through the context of the Korean War, you can see the social and technological changes that began to take place in the U.S. just five years after the end of World War II. And then on the left side of the reflecting pool, you have the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, also part of the Cold War in the 1950s. The French, they begin to leave Southeast Asia. As they leave, you have the spread of communism into the region. And the United States attempted to stop the spread of communism by backing the South Vietnamese government, ended up spending 16 years there. The fall of Saigon, April 30th, 1975, marked the end of that war. The United States lost the Vietnam War, and there was a lot of debate how to commemorate it, given how controversial it had been. Conscription was U.S. law until 1973. A lot of young men drafted into the Vietnam War, and sadly, many never came home. And it was decided that a memorial would be held for the... This is the other company that does these Capital Express. On your right, Capital Express. <laughs> Ours is a vintage Model T. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> oh, they did not mean to honk. I meant to do my blinker, but oh well. Oh, it works. <laughs> Honking is a universal language here in Washington, D.C. So the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, uh, the winning design for that memorial done by Maya Lin uh, has the names of the 60,000 soldiers who died serving for the United States and Vietnam over those 16 years. On my right here are the Daughters of the American Revolution, a historical society. And uh, last thing I wanted to say about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, has those names there. Vietnam Veterans, they were influential or instrumental in, in raising money to get that memorial started. It had its 40th anniversary, Veterans Day, uh, earlier this month. Oh, wow. And that's the debriefing for the Lincoln Memorial stop. We'll go ahead and make our way to the White House for the last stop of the tour. Up here, this is the Octagon. We saw the uh, Pentagon from afar earlier. Now we're looking at the Octagon. It's not really the shape of an octagon. And ironically, it's the headquarters for the American Institute of Architects. But yeah. interestingly enough, on a historical note, that housed the uh, residence for President James Madison, First Lady Dolly Madison, after the British burned the White House in the War of 1812. It was there when it was safe to return to Washington, the Madisons moved in. 
It was there that James Madison signed his end of the peace deal with Great Britain, resulting in the Treaty of Ghent, ending the War of 1812. First Lady Dolly Madison, she was instrumental in keeping the capital here in Washington, D.C. Many wanted the capital to move back to Philadelphia, given the destruction of Washington. Many people simply didn't like it, but preferred Philadelphia anyway, but Dolly Madison, she really was insistent, uh, insisting that it stay here, and it obviously did. Yeah, go Dolly Madison. So, yeah. I went to, uh, being a James Madison University student, I spent a lot of time talking about the Madisons. Up here, uh, the World Bank on my left. Coming up here, it's situated right along Pennsylvania Avenue. The Avenues of Washington, D.C. run diagonally. Each one named after a state. Pennsylvania Avenue, or Pennsylvania gets the crown jewel of the Main Street of Washington because the capital was originally in Pennsylvania, so kind of an olive branch to the state of Pennsylvania. I never really thought of that, but that makes sense. Yeah, Massachusetts Avenue, Embassy Road. So, an important street here in, in uh, D.C. Oh, we just got a street somewhere in Capitol Hill. There's like an overpass, and that's it. That's it. That's oh, yeah, yeah. Some of them are not, not that, like Virginia Avenue. Not that great. D.C. actually had its Virginia spelled wrong, which was kind of funny. <laughs> On the left here, this is the Renwick Gallery, that French building. And there's also another French building on the right. The Renwick Gallery, it's the Smithsonian Museum. Remember James Renwick, he actually uh, designed the Smithsonian Castle. So one of the 19 museums is named after him. That one features American art. But you might have seen the large gray uh, French building on the other side of the street. That's the old executive office building. It was supposed to be torn down in the 60s. First Lady Jackie Kennedy, she loved it so much. She saved it from being torn down. Uh, critics argue that it architecturally did not match the rest of the city, but she had the common sense to point out that it was pretty in its own right, and it stayed. Uh, nowadays, it is used as offices for White House staffers, and there's a, a tunnel connecting it next door. And Jackie Kennedy, she also saved Grand Central Station in New York yep. City, so she was an avid historical preservationist. And she also made Georgetown uh, even more popular, because that architecture there, Georgetown, very pretty. She was... Uh, really an advocate for those buildings up. And so if you don't remember anything else from the tour, I hope you will always remember just by looking at the street signs of Washington, you will always know where you are in relation to the Capitol building. We are at 17th and 8th Streets Northwest. That puts us 17 blocks west of the Capitol building, each the eighth letter of the alphabet, eight blocks north. So if nothing else, I've helped you navigate the streets of Washington, D.C. a little bit easier. <laughs> well, I tried, but, you know, the diagonal street is yeah, like... Yeah, the states you have to memorize that. Yeah, I can't help you there. Yeah. But if you're at 1600 Pennsylvania, then you're still 16 blocks from, from the Capitol building. Yep. You know, I once asked a trick question. I actually, it was uh, that we used to play a game called Stump the Teacher. So I asked a trick question. What's the address in the White House? They said 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I said, nope, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest. Yeah, because Southeast, that's just a, an apartment building. I'm sure they got a lot of weird mail. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Coming up on the right here, this is the White House gift shop, famous for releasing an ornament every year for Christmas. You can see those ornaments on display. So they come out of that gift shop there. Uh, my family, we have the 2002 ornament because 11-year-old me got to do a White House tour a few days after Christmas, and I thought the White House was huge, but we're pulling up to it in a minute. If you've never been to D.C. before, I just don't want you to be disappointed. It's a very pretty building, but it's not a palace by any means. Does anybody here know who was the first president to live in the White House? Oh, I knew that one, but I forgot. Somebody I haven't mentioned at all today, but I think he deserves a shout-out. Uh, Adams? John Adams, that's yep. right. You all have been really good with the trivia today. John Adams and First Lady Abigail Adams moved into the White House in 1800, the year that the, the Capitol moved down here. And I'm going to park here on the right. Just be careful when getting out because, again, we have a lot of this uh, through traffic. We'll walk up to the White House fence and then call it a day, and I'll drop you all off at your respective future destinations. Nice. Yep.
So that flag there is a Turkestan flag. Turkestan. Turkestan is a region in China, oh, wow. predominantly Uyghur, uh, and they're protesting the treatment, uh, the brutal treatment by the Chinese government. I wanted some Uyghur food, but I don't think I'll get that this trip. Oops, sorry. The last three for the rest of my life. <laughs> Across the street here, this is the Hay Adams Hotel. It was built during Prohibition. It came with a functioning speakeasy in the basement within eyesight of the White House. So you can see that Prohibition really just did not work out in this country. Nope. We just had to drink. <laughs> you just had to drink. That's right. I mean, Watch yourself. You're in, a, you're in a curve. And then across the street here, this yellow church here, St. John's Episcopal Church. Visited by every country that we've been You know what I always wanted to do? I don't know how you do this. I always wanted to bowl in the Truman Bowl now. Well, guess what, dude? Yeah. I heard it's under the portico. Yeah, I heard of people being a, like being allowed to go in there and bowl. But like, Yo, how do you do that? I'll tell you what. Take your hat off out of respect. And let's look this way, bro. One, two, three. Oops, and another one, two, three. There you go. Thank you. Can you do one without my glasses? Oh, okay. Uh, one, two, three. There we go. We need to shave, so. Yeah, I know we do. We have to stop. Anybody else? Okay, hold on. 
Yeah, this is cold. Yes, it is. We're vacating. <laughs> really? Yep. Oh, wow. We had a big set of cojones. It's like Trent. Yeah. Trent has got such a big set of cojones that are getting in the way of his brain. Yeah. What's this gate to? Huh? What's this gate this to? This is a... Uh, this is a, a, a thing blocking uh, the statue. <gasps> Boy, old Dom's been in more room of the White House than most people. Dom. Dom. Yeah. Disabled card also. You actually don't get to see this on a White House tour. Nope. I mean, unless, like, we know somebody and I pull the blind card, then I might be able to get into it. But, I mean, I don't know what they would do with you. They'd probably be like, no, only he can get in it. What's the one where so Abraham the Lincoln now? used to go across the street all the time? Was the it telegraph the, building. At the, Blair, the Blair House? Yeah, you the, the, the flag the, of the Blair House from here. Do you see the U.S. flag there? Yeah. Uh, it's a white warehouse. Yeah, that's the Blair House. Yeah, he used to go there to use the telegraph. Not the, not the brown stone building, but behind it is a white warehouse with the flag on it. You can see the flag from here. That's the Blair House. 
And then Grant, President Grant, he would go to the Willard Hotel. That's where he would hang out with his friends all the time. He would stay up late drinking and smoking, something the First Lady couldn't stand. She said, if you're going to do that, you got to go to the Willard Hotel. He would cut through the lobby. And they say that's where the term lobbying became popularized in the United States because the public started seeing him there a couple nights a week. And they would wait for him in the lobby. It's been used, the word lobbying is used in British politics long before, but that's when it's caught on. So I hope you enjoyed the tour and I hope you can see how the National Mall and its monuments represent the different chapters of American history. So thank you very much and I'll go ahead and if you're ready, we'll go ahead and take you to uh, your respective drop off locations. Well, thank you so much. So Wonderful. Aaron's too. Space, 14th and I, and Old National Post Office. Oh my God, good, good. Have a nice day. That's what that means. Thank you. What are you talking about? Huh? He asked to don't stop hating each other. Each other yes. You disagree. disagree. I exact. I agree with that so much. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why when people started doing that, but they got. You should stop. Crazy. If Mickey Haley was president and I ended up getting the White House tour and I ended up meeting her. And you know what came up? What? No. <laughs> that would be you. That would be you. And they're probably not gonna let your side of the ass in the White House. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the thing that her and I have in common. Right. <laughs> no. <laughs> You, you you ain't right, Daddy. The food. Mm, no. I give up. Well, we like watching. The kind of I have oh, that would be great. She'd have a blast having so the pants. Uh, stand by for Eh, she's funny. It will be great fake exe an executive order to stop the Panthers from losing. Oh, that's us? Yeah. Yep, 14th and I, just make, uh... Okay, just happy. My street is one way, so I will call down the first. Careful, Joe. There's a big... There's a curb. You gotta go down the curb and then up the... Yeah, I got a tour tonight, so um, I take the, the cart back to the garage, I charge it for a couple hours, I have some downtime, and then back to the evening tour. 
And I didn't know when I got this job, I didn't know what I was going to do with this downtime because it was too far away to go back to Alexandria. So I tricked myself into joining a gym. So now I go to the gym. But it's kind of worked because when I, whenever I'm done for the day with work, I'm not going to the gym. But if I have that break in between, I'll force myself into the gym. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, so I tricked myself. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot. I think if you wanted to do Arlington National Cemetery, you would definitely have plenty to see. Oh, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Uh, the Merchant Marine Memorial is next to it, too. So I think if you did, uh, you know, it and a couple other things, it would be worth it. What's, like, the best kept secret that nobody knows they should really go Um, I, I think that old National Post Office. In the warmer months, I say, is everyone, uh, Safely see them? Yes. Okay, yeah. so I'll, I'll uh, drive away now. The old National Post Office is a really good secret because now it's a hotel. It's the Waldorf Hotel. But the, the building, the old National Post Office, is still owned by the government. People don't know that they can go in there even if they're not staying at the hotel. So I think it's a great... The DC Wharf is kind of new. Not a lot of people know about it yet. Together. In the warmer months, I recommend the water taxis. We're not known for being kind of a water riverside town, but yeah. those water taxis are really fun. You can even pick go all the way to Mount Vernon. U Street was cool. That yeah, was U Street. Yeah, that's a lot of local history there. Yeah. Duke Ellington became popular on U Street. Properly, weren't we? 